Again, welcome to the summit and, and thanks to Steve Reicha and to all of our bosses here today, uh, Glenn Woodbury and all of our FEMA and TED partners for allowing us to talk a little bit with you this morning about a very serious topic, school and mass shootings. And you've seen in the materials we're really framing today's conversation by asking not just the three esteemed panelists that I hear, have here on the panel with me today, but certainly we want to speak with, with you all, recognizing we're surrounded by Homeland Security experts in this room. What is Homeland Security's role? Are school and mass shootings, are they public safety events? Are they just larger in scale and the optics of tragedy? Or are they somehow different or more meaningful or more impactful to our communities in both the ways that the imagery affects us or in the public safety and public policy decisions that we're forced to make. So we'll be spending uh, time this morning until about 10.15. We'll take a break um, talking with each of our panelists here. Uh, we'll open up and I'll ask for each of them after I introduce them to you uh, to make some initial first comments and then we'll certainly um, be sure to reserve time at the end to um, allow you to engage them in your own questions and certainly share some of your own insights. Starting out this morning, we'll, we'll hear from each of our panelists and, and they'll share some insights and really uh, a theme that might not be evidenced by the title that's in the program that we're also going to talk about is not just Homeland Security's role uh, in the mass and, shoot, and school shooting topic but really, how does all of your work in academia translate on important public top policy topics this morning's being these mass shootings that we'll be discussing? So we'll start uh, first this morning uh, with my colleague to my far right, James Allen Fox, who um, now has told me that I can refer to him as Jamie Fox, though as, I, as long as I concede he was the original Jamie Fox. <laughs> so Dr. James Allen Fox uh, is the uh, Lippman Family Professor of Criminology, Law, and Public Policy uh, at Northeastern University. He has published 18 books, including uh, Extreme uh, Killing, and uh, also uh, as a member of the Board of Contributors, has also um, published several articles and uh, opinion pieces in his affiliation with USA Today. I'll, I'll also call out a second book of one of the many that Jamie has authored um, on uh, topic for today, and that is um, my Violence and Killing, and really looking at how those affect our schools from, both from kindergarten all the way up through college. Uh, Professor uh, Fox uh, served also um, as an expert uh, witness in litigation in several mass shootings. He led the investigation for Seattle's Capitol Hill massacre for the Seattle Police Department, and he was also on President Clinton's advisory committee on school shootings. Uh, finally, Jamie is also manager, manager and manages the Associated Press, USA Today, Northeastern University Mass Killing Database. So Jamie's going to bring to us today a, a conversation and get us kicked off talking about really the role of research, what he has found from a multi-decade career, uh, really looking at mass shootings, active shootings, and school shootings. So Professor Fox, thank you for joining us today. Okay. Anyway, uh, I show you, this is the first book I did in this topic, just as background on me, that I've been studying this topic for 40 years, and she can prove it. That's me on the left side, picture taken 40 years ago. Obviously, I've aged. So it's been a long time that I've been focusing on this topic, and back then, no one in this country really paid that much attention. Uh, not like now. I mean, we, it's not like we didn't have major mass shootings back in the 80s and then to the 90s. And you know, we had the postal shooting, 14 killed in Ed Edmond, Oklahoma, which gave rise to the term going postal. McDonald's massacre of 21, which the New York Post called the Big Mac attack. Uh, it had a, a mall shooting in uh, Springfield, um, Pennsylvania, the Luby's Cafeteria, 23 people killed. So we had mass shootings back then. People would sometimes say, oh, we never had these before. Yes, we did. Our memories are short. Uh, but then, 
things changed in 2012. You know, they say that bad things happen in threes, and they did have some very bad things happen that year. We had the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting. We had the Oikos University shooting. And of course, the uh, worst of all, the Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School massacre, which the Associated Press, uh, every year they do their list of top st stories of the year, uh, said uh, Sandy Hook was the number one story of the year. It beat out the presidential election. It beat out the other Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, which, by the way, killed many more people than the shooting in Connecticut. However, uh, Hurricane Sandy basically killed elderly, only one child, whereas Sandy Hook involved uh, 20 children, which certainly got our attention. And things changed after that. The public started being concerned about mass shootings, politicians, and professors as well. This shows you the number of publications, scholarly publications over the years. In the 80s, when I was starting this work with my friend Jack Levin, hardly anything was published. It was very easy back then to stay on top of the literature, <laughs> only like 10 articles a year. Now, uh, as many as 2,000 articles a year being published on, on mass shootings. I've given up trying to keep on top of the literature. Amazing uh, surge in interest among the pu public and academics as well. There's a sense in our public that there's an epidemic going on, an epidemic of mass shooting. I hear that all the time. Now, I, I love uh, Morning Joe, one of my favorite TV shows, and Joe Scarborough saying we have a, we're in the midst of an epidemic of mass shootings. Uh, Beto O'Rourke using very colorful language, which you can understand because this was right after the El Pasto uh, mass shooting, saying also that there's an epidemic and so and so, what he says there. Um, school shootings are the new normal. This is a, some, something I hear all the time. Well, I'm not, sure, sure it's, I'm not sure it's true. I'm not so sure there's an epidemic, however we, we're, we're gonna define epidemic. But what there is an epidemic is of fear, absolutely. Uh, the Chapman University tracked their, in their fear index what people are afraid of in America every year, and you can see that fear of mass shooting rose from about 16% to about 41%. Uh, after that, of course, fear of uh, COVID took over first place. Uh, and some of the surveys show how people are really changing their lives out of fear. 41, 21% avoid certain places. Don't go to concerts or movie theaters or restaurants because they're afraid of being the victim of a mass shooting. Uh, six out of 10 Americans fear that there'll be a mass shooting in their neighborhood, in their community. And, and this is amazing, that 25% of Americans believe that mass shootings are responsible for more gun deaths, more deaths than any other type of, type of gun crime or gun event, more than suicide, more than gang homicide. Absolutely false. Uh, mass shootings are responsible for one-third of 1% 1 of gun deaths in this country. But clearly, it uh, gets all the attention and fear. Um, now, I don't want to overdo it with too many statistics, because that really is uh, mass murder. But it's important to see the facts uh, as opposed to the fears. Um, I maintain, as, as, as Don mentioned, thank you, I, I maintain the USA, the Associated Press USA Today mass shooting database. It's, uh, uh, it's available, the, the website's available, it's interactive, there's also a public database of, of every mass killing since 2006. There's actually 518 because uh, two days ago there was one in Aurora, Colorado when I didn't have a chance to update this. Uh, every, uh, these are cases of four more people killed. 80% uh, by gunfire, so 80, about 400 cases uh, since 2006 of uh, mass shootings where four or more people are killed, which is the traditional definition of mass shootings, four or more people killed by gunfire. Now, let's look at the trends. Now, it is true that there's many more mass shootings now than there were in the 70s and 80s and the early 90s. But over the past couple of decades, there really hasn't been that much change. Yes, a little bit of increase in the past few years. This is the, this is the 15 years of data. Uh, not much of an increase in the number of cases, a slight increase, but again, keep in mind that the population of the United States increased 11% over this time period, and that can account for most of the increase, just population change. How about in terms of the number of people killed? Well, yes, we've seen an increase in the severity of mass shootings. Uh, and it's basically has to do with 
uh, several very high profile incidents. For example, if you look at all mass shootings in this country, historically, over time, uh, there have been nine with 20 or more people killed. Six of those nine have occurred in the past 10 years. So clearly those have dominated the news cycle. But one thing I want to point out, the red are public mass shootings, shootings in schools and churches and restaurants, concerts. The most we've ever had is 10. So far this year, we've had five. Most mass shootings occur in private homes, family annihilations like the one two days ago in Aurora, Colorado, or gang uh, conflicts or uh, massacres involving drug trade. Those people don't really worry about. They worry about the public ones because they can happen to anyone at any time at anywhere. But those are rare, extremely rare, but frightful and, and, and impactful when they do happen, of course. Um, there's also fear in terms of schools. 57% of students say they fear that there'll be a shooting in their school. Now, I have to, you, know, you admire, have to admire uh, the survivors of Parkland and, and March for Our Lives and the dedication they have uh, to the cause of, of gun control. Yet some of those slogans really, they get to you, but they're hardly accurate. I, I want to go to my graduation, not to my grave. The chances of graduating are much higher than going to your grave. It's important that we keep these things in perspective. Uh, this, is a, this is a chart, in fact, using the uh, Center for Homeland Defense and Security data set of uh, school shootings since the 70s. And the blue are the number of shooting incidents in which someone's killed. And the red is the number of victims killed. Now, you can see, of course, that we've had some some uh, high death toll school shootings that uh, certainly we all recall, Evaldi and, and Columbine and Sandy Hook. Um, but in terms of the number of incidents, there were actually more in the 90s. Most people are surprised by that fact that there were more in the 90s. That was when uh, we had uh, uh, the uh, Bill Clinton st established this advisory committee that I served on. The, Amer the uh, Department of Education sent around to every school in America a pamphlet called Warning Signs. Uh, there was tremendous concern back then about school shootings. Um, and there was also conspir conspiracy theories. I know, you know, we often talk about the false flags theories and the fact that people who say that, that uh, Sandy Hook was staged and, and Parkland was staged. Well, the whopper of all the conspiracy theories were dur during the Clinton years, where this uh, right-wing conspiracy group plotted every single ma uh, multiple victim shooting in schools that occurred during Clinton's administration. And amazingly, they fell on two straight lines perfectly, better than my regression lines fit. And where did they cross? You may not be able to see that. Hope, Arkansas, Bill Clinton's birthplace. They believed that Bill Clinton was in cahoots with these kids to commit these shootings in schools that will discredit the, the uh, gun ownership and then have American turn away from the Second Amendment. Crazy. Um, it's interesting, though, about those years. We had, in the 90s, eight multiple victim shootings in schools, with at least two people killed and at least four people shot, eight of them in five years. West Paducah, Pearl, Jonesboro, Springfield, of course, Columbine. And after the one in Santee, California, in March of 2001, uh, Dan Rather, CBS News, declared that school shootings are a national epidemic. But you know what? There wasn't another one for four years. Would you think, uh, you think that Dan Rather, what he said, had, <laughs> had the effect? I, I don't think so. I, I often ask people, why do you think there was not another one for four years? And most people don't know, but I bet this crowd knows, right? Why was there not another one for four years? 9-11, right. So, March, we had the shooting, then summertime, and then September came. And you know what happened? We stopped talking about school shootings. Because back in the 90s, there was so much obsession and discussion and debate about school shootings that we continued to fuel the, the contagion, continued to send the message to kids that if you're angry with your classmates, with administration, bring a gun to school, because that's what people do. We stopped talking about it when we focused on other kinds of terrorism, international terrorism, and uh, the contagion evaporated. A lesson for now. All right, why the disconnect between 
the number of cases and uh, the fear. Well, a lot of people say, find it unfathomable or, or unsu very surprising when I say there's no epidemic, like Jake Tapper. Can't believe that there's no epidemic. Well, two reasons. One is there's, some very con there's a lot of mass confusion about what is a mass shooting uh, and, so, and some conflicting databases. And two is the nature of the media coverage. Uh, a lot of attention is given to the gun violence archive. In 2012, they said, well, you know, there's nothing that says, uh, that, nothing in the word mass shooting that implies that people have to be, be killed. So they, they define it as a form of people shot. Well, that's fine. They can do that. And it's a wonderful database. But keep in mind that, that half of the cases in the gun violence archive, no one gets killed. Three quarters of the time, at most one person gets killed. Only 5% of these are the traditional definition of mass shootings. Now, that's fine. The problem is when you confuse the two. For example, there's more than one mass shooting a day in this country. Yeah, but all the examples they gave are mass killings with lots and lots of victims. It amazes, it's easy for people to get confused. Even the New York Times. Uh, in, in May of 2001, they published this partial list of mass shootings in the United States. 13 of them. By the way, those are mass killings. All of those had lots of people die, at least four. But they say, here's an incomplete list. There are many, many, many more. Yeah, there were, but they weren't like these. The many, many more had no one killed or one person killed. But they don't say that. So that's why people think this is an epidemic. Now, school shootings. It's also about the definitions. This is, again, from the, the, uh, your database, the CHDS database. Um, when you start looking at all victims, you know, 230 have been killed since 2010. Well, you whittle it down. Then uh, 90 inside of school, 84 uh, during school. Turns out how many students? 68. An average of about six a year. I don't want to minimize the pain and suffering of those families or communities. But let's understand that six students a year out of 54 million. Uh, and by the way, 28% of the fatalities and, and injuries and in school shootings are not in the school. They're on the playground, the parking lot, athletic fields. So everything we do about uh, uh, active shooter drills and armed guards and surveillance cameras will have no effect on the vast majority of school shootings because they're not inside the school. Media, seeing is believing, they say, and you know, things change. So when, when Sandy Hook happened, people said, you know, so I can understand a high school shooting, but elementary school kids, wow, they was just shocked. Well, there was one in 1989, Stockton, California, uh, six killed, I'm sorry, five killed and 30 wounded, but, no, but it, very few people remember it. It wasn't on television. CNN was the only cable channel, and it had just begun, didn't have much of a subscriber list. Uh, we didn't have satellite trucks, didn't have uh, uh, the ability to beam into people's living rooms like Sandy Hook, the images of children being led away from their school with tears still fresh in their eyes. It makes it feel like it's happening down the street. And I remember, for example, Marathon, this was uh, the Virginia Tech shooting. It was Marathon Monday in the city of Boston. I remember very well, I ran the marathon that day. Uh, and I, you probably don't believe that, I don't look like the type, but I did, I ran the width of it, 26.2 uh, <laughs> feet. Everybody else did the length. I got home and they had marathon coverage of the shooting and the, and the anchors were giddy. Oh, there's now six killed, now there's 10 killed. Oh, now there's 20, now it's 23, it's the largest, now it's the largest school shooting in history. Now 30, now 32, it's the largest mass shooting of any kind. You know, we love records in this country. Uh, Texas school shooting was the deadliest since uh, Parkland. But it was only three months earlier. Somehow, it, it wouldn't be any less serious if it wasn't a, a, uh, a record. All right, so oftentimes, we do the right thing, but for the wrong reason. For example, mental health. In the wake of mass shootings, we talk about expanding mental health services. Barack Obama went to Hartford after Sandy Hook and said, we need to do something about the mentally ill before it's too late. Well, why? Are we concerned about the well-being of the mentally ill? Or are we concerned about the well-being of the people they may shoot? It's really the latter. 
And that all, all that really does is to reinforce the stigma associated with being mentally ill by fusing it, confusing it with mass shootings. In fact, very few mass shooters are mentally ill. 5% are schizophrenic or are psychotic. Yeah, another 25% are depressed or various other ailments, unhappy people to be sure. But, it's, but most of them are not mentally ill. These are well-planned executions by people who are clear-headed, clear-thinking, and want revenge. And the thing is, these guys see themselves as victims. If you offer them mental health treatment, they say, hell no. Yeah, I want treatment. I want fair treatment. Not that psychological kind. Now, if, see, expanding mental health services is the right thing to do for the millions of Americans who, give it, who could benefit. You don't have to tie it to mass shootings. We should be talking about it on, 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 a, on any day of the week, not necessarily the day after a shooting. It's important that we do that, but for other reasons. Gun control. Lots of good ideas, certainly. But the irony of all these good ideas, smart things, I believe, is that uh, the mass shootings, which, which motivate this discussion, uh, are the least likely to be impacted by these very actions because mass shooters are very determined individuals. They will get a gun no matter what we put in their path. We should continue to try, but these will take a nibble out of crime. The, but the big bite out of crime is the 20,000 other gun homicides we have every year, as well as the 25,000 suicides, not mass shootings. Um, now, things do work. The research we've done, uh, permits to purchase, uh, states that have permits to purchase laws, which are much more detailed and thorough than, a, than the FBI's background check, uh, those states have significantly lower rates of mass shootings, public mass shootings. And states that have limits on the size of, of, uh, of magazines, large capacity magazines, they have significantly lower number of people killed or injured if there is a mass shooting. There are things we can do. Now, it's interesting, NRA, NRA loves to quote me. It's interesting. They know I'm a, a, I'm a gun control person, but they kind of like this idea when I say that the, you know, there's no epidemic, fits into their, into their themes, into their language. Uh, not, but I, it's surprising that they like quote me so much, but I don't agree with them. So let me wrap it up, because I only have a few more minutes here. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I did a podcast for Reason.com and the uh, host uh, tweeted out this statement that James Ellen Fox, a prominent person in the area of mass shooting, says there's no, there's no evidence of an epidemic. Well, that was picked up by Laura Ingram. She tweeted it, and, and Donald Trump retweeted it. My number of tweet followers went up thousands. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I don't, the, the thing is that they misunderstood the message. There is a problem. It may not be an epidemic, but it still is a problem. So, thank you. And I have a few minutes for your yes. second and, part. And, and I do have one question for you, Jamie, and, and before I even pose it, Jamie mentioned uh, the CHDS school shooting database. Uh, our colleague, David Reedman, was originally scheduled to be on our panel, and many of mm -hmm. you may know, David, alum of our master's program and our advanced uh, thinking of Homeland Security program where he and some of his uh, classmates launched our own K-12 school shooting database, of which we still have a school shooting compendium, a mass shooting compendium. Uh, and David was uh, deployed to help in Hurricane Ian relief. He and his wife live in Florida. So our thoughts are with him as he's doing work there. But thank you, Jamie, for mentioning that. And, and my question to you is related to school shootings. What, if anything, should schools be doing differently to secure and provide for the safety of the students and faculty in, in any type of event? Well, we can make students safe without making them afraid. And unfortunately, a lot of things we do intensify their fears. We send the message to them, the bad guy's out to get you. Because if that's, we would be doing all this stuff to protect you if you weren't in danger. Uh, so. Things like, uh, of course, uh, arming teachers. You know, marksmanship, as far as teachers are concerned, marksmanship should be about A's and B's, not guns and ammo. They should not be educate. They should educate the students, not executing them. We don't have we don't have um, math teachers uh, being police officers, and we shouldn't have police officers teaching math. So, um, active shooter drills. Uh, Forty states require them. 
And some of them are extremely um, graphic and, and, and realistic with fake blood and someone running around with, with a gun and, and camouflage clo uh, clothing. Um, a lot of schools do unannounced drills. In fact, some schools will get a loudspeaker and say, this is not a drill. When it really, went, when it really is. They want it to be realistic. Um, in fact, in Parkland, they had unannounced drills. And when the real thing happened, a lot of teachers didn't know. They, could, they were confused. They thought it was a drill. Um, the Rev wonderful experiment looking at the tweets of students before and after drills. After the drill, tweets that they sent that reflected depression, anxiety, stress went way up. Now, I understand that. Many of you do too, who were living during the 60s like I was. We had the duck and cover drills. Right? We had to get on our desk in case there was an atomic bomb. Now, I never thought about the atomic bomb because I was 11 and I, all I thought about was, what, they, what are they going to have for lunch? And would the bullies get me before I got a chance to eat? <laughs> but the nights we had those drills, I'd go home and lie awake and really think, well, what would it be like? Now, I now know what it would be like. If an atomic bomb dropped in Boston, Massachusetts, my desk in Newton, 11 miles away, would be vaporized, and so would I. We need to take a lesson from the airlines and the cruise lines. You know, in an airline, they tell you what to do in the case of a water landing, euphemism for crash. Uh, we then don't actually do a drill where the, you know, we, have, we have to slide down the slides on the runway. It'd be very traumatizing. Our, our cruises, I go on cruises. My first cruise, they say, tomorrow we have to go to our muster station. I had no idea what that is. I brought a hot dog. <laughs> Think. But you, know, you put your life jacket, so when they tell you what, where your lifeboat is, but you don't actually go into the, into the lifeboat and load down to the water. Too traumatizing. But we do that to our kids. We should just tell, first of all, we should do drills with the teachers, administration, and talk to the kids about what to do. Like the flight attendant, they tell you what to do. And also tell your kids, if something bad happens, listen to an adult. Um, I like the measures that are unattru unobtrusive. Uh, so, for example, like the rebuild of Sandy Hook, which used landscaping, or things like uh, uh, acoustic sensors in the, in the halls, which are so small the kids don't even know they're there. It protects them because if there is a shooting, immediately the, the local law enforcement get alerted to the fact there's a shooting in the school. Not only that, they, on their computer screens, there's a map of the school showing them exactly where the shooter is. Because one of the problems with these high school shootings is the first responders get there, and they have no clue where the shooter is. So these are good things. Or we, rather than spending all this money on hardware, just spend it on school psychologists, guidance counselors, and teachers. That's the way to go. Um, so my time is up, and I thank you. Thank you, Professor Pat. No problem. No problem.